I really, really can't tell you how thrilled I am to introduce the amazing Raymond Thompson Jr. this evening. Raymond was selected to be the 2020 Lynn Scratch Student Prize winner by an almost unanimous vote. And as Brandon pointed out, I write about photography almost every day. I've seen thousands and thousands and thousands of projects over the years and Raymond's really blew my mind. Um, his powerful body of work, Appalachian Ghost, is presented with four different approaches to storytelling, each adding new considerations to the documented African-American visual history. The work, in his words, challenges the political nature of archives and pushes back against the history of photography that has consistently been used to silence and erase black and brown bodies. As he states, specifically, I'm looking at what has been left out of the African-American visual history, which to date has mainly been documented with a colonial gaze. From this standpoint, I have sought to recreate work that has been informed by and made from historical documents and photographs. Raymond is a freelance photographer and multimedia producer based in Morgantown, West Virginia. He currently serves as a multimedia producer at West Virginia University and is also pursuing an MFA in photography at the same institution. So he's working, he's a student, and besides all that, he's a husband and father. He received his master's degree from the University of Texas at Austin in journalism and graduated from the University of Mary Washington with a BA in American Studies. He's worked as a freelance photographer for the New York Times, The Intercept, NBC News, ProPublica, WBEZ, Google, Merrill, and the Associated Press. And you can also find Raymond in conversation with Aaron Turner through the Photographers of Color podcast. And he, along with William Camargo, another Lynn Scratch Student Prize winner, are the current refrigerator curators for the autumn 2020 exhibition of the Curated Fridge. And I know they want to see your work. There's three days left to submit. Um, and both of those links, Aaron's, uh, the Photographers of Color podcast and the Curated Fridge will be in the link. It is such an honor to introduce this stellar visual artist, Raymond Thompson, Jr. Thank you so much, Eileen, for that introduction. And thank you to the LA Center for Photography for having me do this presentation, I'm very excited. Um, so let's let's jump in. I will don't we um, let's see here. Let's share screen. Boom. All right. So I'm gonna just start off a brief introduction about who I am and some of my work to date. Um, so my work is centered on the impact of erasure on identity and representation. Um, I'm specifically focusing on the stories and myths of the African and African-American diaspora that have actively and passively been deleted from our cultural memory. I'm equally interested in the more passive ways in which these narratives have been gradually lost through time and forgetting. My interest in these narratives of the unknown past stem from an artificial cap of my own personal history. This erasure begins after my grandfather left the South during the Great Migration. From that moment, many parts of my family's histories were lost to the forgetting inherent in verbal histories. I wanted to pick up where the historical memory and cultural myths left off. I am exploring these ideas in my work by appropriating primary source materials and photographs. And I'm using this research to inspire the creation of new speculative historical based work. But before we go there, let's back up and let's sort of talk about where I came from. Um, I spent several, a long period of time working as a photojournalist and as a documentarian. I wanted to show you guys a couple of images from my project, Justice Undone. Um, and this project looks at the impact of incarceration on families and communities. Um, and I tried to take a sort of geographic approach. 
um, to this story and looking at zip codes and looking at the actual impact on, on a neighborhood level, um, just to sort of figure out a different way to tell a story. Um, I purposely avoided um, going into prisons um, or focusing too much on folks who have been incarcerated. And I really tried to spend time on um, children specifically and other people who are left behind. Um, this is the image of Beverly Brown, and she's important because she represents the, she's like the, the very tip of a pyramid of, of um, sort of a generational um, divide that trickles down. Like hers was the first generation in which um, we started to see the war on drugs impact families. Um, she watched her brothers be put in prison and then watched her children go to prison and then was currently was watching her grandchildren go suffer the same fate. And this story, her angle, the story specifically looked at that and tried to tease out um, how, how essentially mass incarceration is affecting families over generations. This image is from the aptly called Youth Study Center from um, that which is located in New Orleans. Um, yeah, in this image for me, it was also an important image from this project simply because it, it sort of placed these, these young men um, who almost looked like chess pieces um, playing basketball, which is something that everyone has done or is very familiar with the basketball hoop and, and focuses this beautiful blue sky day with this massive large fence that's simply meant to keep them in. Um, this image is also important um, in my in my process and flow. Um, it essentially is a double exposure, um, and the woman the women are coming in in a van trip, who drove who drove about nine hours from Richmond, Virginia, all the way into Appalachia to Southern West Virginia to visit their loved ones who are incarcerated at Red Onion um, State a state prison. Um, the trip again took like eight hours for some people and some people travel, traveled even further to get to these spaces. Um, this was the first time that I think I actually like switched up the way I made photographs. I mean, it's a double exposure. I like, literally I turned one direction, shot a picture of the prison then turned around and quickly shot a picture of people inside the, the van in that space. Um, but it also got me thinking um, about like, who was I making these images for? Uh, the whole Justice Undone project, um, I couldn't help but feel or wonder if I was trying to make um, the people in these images like palatable to a certain audience. And then I realized, well, who's your audience? And I, I came up with the conclusion that it was a mostly white, like a middle-class educated audience who was looking at these pictures. And Bell Hooks said something, I read something from Bell Hooks that kind of stuck with me. Um, she said that black essentialism is a hallmark born out of the identity politics of um, post-colonial post -colonial narratives. And I was wondering, I was just wondering if I was feeding into the problem by making these images using the same tools and techniques that have been already used to document and to define people of color. Um, I was really influenced by this work. Like this is like pre-graduate school reading that I had done. Um, Christina Sharp's wake, uh, wake work. She wrote a book um, titled In the Wake on Blackness and Being. And in this book, um, she argues that artists play a critical role in examining the historical traumas of America's racial pasts. And I'm gonna read a couple of quotes from Christina. Um, so living in the wake means the history and presence of terror from slavery to the present as the ground of our everyday Black existence, living the historical and geographical discontinuous but always present in endless reinvigorated brutality in and on our bodies. While even as that terror is visited on our bodies, the realities of that terror are erased, she writes. And she also writes, I mean wake work to be the mode of inhabiting and rupturing the epistemies of her own lived and unimagined lives. From this analytic, we might imagine otherwise from what we know now in the wake of slavery. Um, this book and these quotes very much motivated me um, as I moved on to my sort of first fine art project um, called Imaging Imagining. Um, I came to this, uh, this project because I was really, I became interested in how African-Americans in, in inhibited the natural environment. Um, again, free reading, and ca I came across a, a book called uh, Black Faces in White Spaces by Carolyn Finney and read a few more quotes. Um, so we consider landscape like national parks and other areas of natural beauty. 
what sorry what you see is not always what you get these places are overlaid with histories unseen sorry histories seen and unseen geographies of fear that can make a natural place in the in the united states suspect to african americans the tree became a painful symbol for black people reminding them that the color of their skin could mean death arguably lynching succeeded in limiting the environmental imaginations of black people whose legitimate fear of the woods served as a painful and very specific reminder that they are they are they serve, there are many places that black persons should not go and one of my research for this project i simply you know you no know, google is a you know it's a tool which kind of works for you but when i googled uh, white people and trees um my my image search from that just sort of rendered about like white people recreating camping hiking um and when i did the same thing for black people and trees all i really got back well 80 like 90 percent of what i got back were lynching images and i wanted to you know work against that with, with these projects. Um, so again, I went and I found that I, I wanted to use the aesthetics of the images had been made before that already existed in the archive. And I wanted to try to essentially replace those images in those archives. So when I Google Black People in Trees, I would begin to see those images. In a way, I was almost trying to heal um, from the visual history of, of the past with this project. So I'm not talking about Appalachian ghosts um, right now. So this is the Hoss Hoxton State Park in Anstead, West Virginia. We're actually looking at a below the dam view of Hoxton State Park. So the history behind this was that in the 1930s, uh, from 1930 to 1933, about 3,000 workers um, came to this place from all over the region to build a, a dam, a powerhouse, and also a three and a half mile tunnel underground. Um, and by drilling this three and a half mile tunnel on the ground, they um, at some point hit a deposit of silica rock. And because they were using improper drilling techniques, um, it kicked up a lot of dust. And that dust was eventually breathed in, causing silicosis. Um, this image is just a, a view from the, the state, the Hawksness, Hawksness State Park overlook, in which you can look down and see the dam itself and also an area. Um, that has been left dry, called the dries, um, that people often recreate in. They can go boulder. You can walk down there and go fishing. About 30 miles away, there is a cemetery called the Hoxness, um, Hoxness Workers Cemetery. Um, so there's very little that sort of points to um, the amount of people who died or, or would during this disaster. Um, the company who did the work estimated that it was about 140 people who passed away, but other researchers and demographers has placed that number closer to 800. Um, this has been called the, the worst industrial disaster in United States history. Um, oftentimes people would die in camp and the bodies would be shipped off immediately. Um, in, some, in one case, it's been reported that um, one of the undertakers took bodies away um, and buried them in what was lost to becoming a farmer, became uh, essentially planted over with corn and the bodies were forgotten. Um, but they were rediscovered when the state went to, um, went to widen the highway um, and the bodies were reburied in this place. So each one of the crosses in this scene um, represented three bodies. Um, it is frightening to stand below this dam. Um, it's, it's, you can feel the power of the water from behind the dam, just the mist in the air. Um, and I've always sort of been terrified about being in this space, not to mention there's a haunted quality. I want to begin to learn what happened in this space, but I wanted to find out more. And so I began my research. Um, so here I want to show you guys sort of like a, or we're going to stop and everyone's going to go look at um, a video, which is sort of like a stream of conscious uh, look into my head before I actually started making work for this project. But I thought it would be interesting for you guys to kind of dive in and see some of my process and what I'm thinking. It's literally like in my head, so there's, it's very jittery, but um, please take a moment to, to, to look at that. 
Right, and just to make sure uh, everyone go to the chat button at the bottom of your screen, there's a link to a Vimeo. Uh, that's where the video can be found. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Lovers and friends stand high above the dam. The beauty, breathtaking, the bend of the new river. Why are you here? Do they know? No one stops to look at the martyr. Hundreds killed, mostly black. Stop. Single word phrases. The walk. What does it mean to me? I've come to this place in search of ghosts. Okay, so we'll just give it about 10 more seconds. That should have allowed enough time for everybody to watch. Um, everyone should probably be back by now. Mute. All right. Um, so this is one of the images that just, uh, sorry, this is one of the images that I came across in my um, research. Um, and it's a really interesting image. I, I want you guys to take like a few, as like a second just to look at how people are rendered within this photograph. Um, as all of you guys are probably familiar, at least with the idea of dodging and burning, like who stands out and who is buried and, and sort of pushed into the background. Um, so out of this archive, there are about like 200 images and about 10 or so feature people, which you can see. Uh, but most of the rest of it, it's just really there to represent the industrial process, documentation of industrial process. Um, um, yeah, so in doing all this research, I found that like, again, amazing that how much of it just didn't focus on people. Um, you can even sort of read the caption on this image. Um, yeah. 
you know, audit number 411 viewing down into audit cut showing first two sections of uh, arch concrete and form is erected. You get the idea. I mean, and this, these captions came along with each and every one of these images. And again, even in the caption, you realize these images weren't about the people. Um, take a good look at this image too for a second. We're gonna come back to this in a few minutes. But I also dug in, some of my research also took me into the West Virginia Library archives to find letters that um, that actually um, say they're doing, there was a congressional hearing in which letters wrote to their US Senator um, describing exactly what it was like to be in the tunnel. So I used documents like this. I used newspaper clippings that also described what happened in Hawks Nuss. And at some point in this process, I began to re realize that archives are political. Um, I'm going to read a quote from Michelle Sean Smith, who wrote photography in the color line, W.E.B. -E du Bois, race and visual culture. Um, once an archive is compiled, it makes a claim on history. It exists as a record of the past. The archive is the vehicle of memory, and it becomes the trace on which a historical record is founded. It makes some people, places, things, ideas, and events visible while relegating others through its signifying absence to invisibility. In this sense, then archives are have an ideological function, not only in the moment of their inception, but also across time, for they determine in large part what will be collectively remembered and how it will be remembered. Uh, one of the things I remember doing uh, was asking because um, I, I found one image that was funny and I was like, hmm, do they have the original of this? So I'd asked the librarian who was there, like, you know, you guys have the original? Because I was looking at facsimiles or sometimes paper copies. Um, they weren't even like, you know, printed on photo paper. Um, and at the time, I didn't realize that the, 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 the negatives were probably on nitrate and would have been very flammable and dangerous. But she told me the story about how the company <clears throat> who currently who's running a Hawks Nest Dam had flown in this stack of these nitrate negatives and the the history center western um, archives you know photocopied them and they took them and flew away um, and i was always hoping that they were still around but recently i discovered that most likely they've been already been destroyed um, but what really struck me was the fact that like our whole visual understanding of this event is trapped in, within the guise of the corporation who essentially did all this work to hide the deed Um, I'm going to read another quote from Photography in the Color Line, um, but archives train, support, and disrupt racial gazes, infusing race into the various structures of how we see and what we know. And from this, I realized that, you know, archives also can be a double-edged sword. Um, it can also be used by the oppressed who have been uh, oppressed um, and to be remade and to add to or be changed or to change to the narratives around. Um, this also, this image, this dust image sort of struck something and haunted me and sparked something in my creative process. Um, but before going there, I wanted to talk a little bit about also the artists that inspired sort of this project and Carrie Mae Weems played a big role in influence um, her project from, from here, I saw what happened and I cried was the big influence. Um, for you, if you don't know, um, these images originally um, were commissioned by Louis Agassiz, who was a biologist and a geologist, and he commissioned photographer J.T. Zeely to create a series of daguerreotypes in the 1850s. These images were used as specific visual evidence to prove the theory, um, to, to prove the physical difference between Europeans and Black Africans. Their primary goal was to prove the racial superiority of the white race, evidence um, for his theory of separate separate creation, which contends that each race originated as a different species. Um, these images were used to help measure facial features and head sizes. Um, what Carrie Mae Weems does here by tinting the photographs a different color, by etching on a piece of glass above it, and by cropping the images on circles was essentially to reclaim these images from the archive that were, were meant to demean Black people. And by, re by reclaiming these images, she sort of made them into portraits and made them, uh, made them into photographs about the individuals. I was also inspired by Christina Mills, the Afronauts. Um, this is probably the first time when I was a photojournalist that I saw someone using at least the myths or stories around a, a, a historical event or, you know, loosely historical event to sort of, you know, make new images around those processes. 
So yeah. Um, so the first image uh, I'm going to show you from my actual like project work is called the dust. And I wanted to uh, really imagine what it was like to be standing next to these workers in this tunnel. Um, I imagine like being in the dust that um, it was probably quite beautiful, but at the same time, was, the workers weren't really aware of the damage to the health that's being caused by this dust. I often use the archival images to find any hints or details within them to sort of like tools or ladders or hoses or, or drill bits um, to, you know, stage these other images. But again, this project developed sort of organically and had you know, four separate parts. Um, I also found within the archive uh, evidence, or at least in my opinion, evidence of uh, images being tampered with, or at least this one specific image being tampered with. Um, notice how in this picture, you have five figures that you can see, five, actually six, there's one back there in the tree. Um, but you notice how this image in which these men have been darkened down in such an intense way. Um, the hypothesis is they were somehow chemically removed um, from the image. Um, but the most important person, again, if you notice in the very first image I showed you is bright and light and clean um, and sort of looking in the direction of the camera. It's a little tighter crop on that image. And you can see that these figures, um, I've done nothing to this image. This is straight from the archive. And from this, I sort of, I produced a triptych called the race in which I combined some of those historical handwritten letters, um, texts with um, the, the single images of these men who have been cut out. I also was inspired by poetry um, from that was written by Merle Ruckheiser. Um, she was interesting. She um, was a poet, but she traveled down to um, Anstead, West Virginia, after she heard about what happened in the Hawksnest State Tunnel. Um, and her, instead of like, you know, writing a book or doing it the usual reporting, um, her output was poetry. And this particular part of this poem, um, George Robinson Blues, um, that I was really struck by. I'm going to read it real fast. Um, as dark as I am, when I came out at morning after the tunnel at night with a white man, no one could have told which man was white. Dust had covered us both and the dust was white. Um, this image, uh, this, this phrase of this poem inspired the, the next set of pictures I'm gonna show you called Tunnelitis. Um, and again, it's like me sort of imagining the very thing of walking out of that tunnel and being covered by this dust. And again, unaware of the deadly consequences of the work I had just done. In that poem, there are sections that also talk about um, how the dust also covered um, the environment outside the tunnel portals. So the trees and the landscape are also covered in dust. I was also very drawn to some of the figures within the pictures that had people in them. Um, I spent a lot of time playing with various combinations, but eventually I had decided to sort of literally blow them up to life size and cut them out. Um, and by doing this, I was working with pretty small image files, like 30 megabyte TIFF files. Um, and these men were already very small, so the computer had to extrapolate the digital files out to make them this big. Um, and I wasn't sure if this is going to work out, but when I printed them up, uh, there is something about, you know, I, what I really noticed is when, we, when I was putting it up against the wall, the stand, all I saw was digital noise, like these cutout shapes of digital noise. But as I still stood away about 10 feet, my brain would sort of work to find the, the features and the characteristics and the things that made them individuals within these images. And I was really drawn to that. 
um, these images, the men had gestures and some images they were smiling. Um, and I felt like in some ways I was in conversation with Kerry Mae work by sort of, again, taking an archive that was meant for another purpose and pulling out the people who have been buried in there and making them into actual portraits. Show you guys a quick rough installation view of sort of what these look like. And my dream one day is to do like an installation project of these figures at Hawk's Nest in some way and a different material than the, uh, I have these currently on. But one day it'd be cool to do a public art project with this work. Um, so the last kind of bit of this talk will be me just looking at the newer work that I've been working on. Um, this is from a series called Amnesia as Survival. And I had, so let me, yeah, I have so many questions about my past, especially after working with Hawk's Nest. Um, and I had, I was trying to dig a little bit deeper to a personal nature with this work. And I had so many questions, sad questions like, so what was my grandfather life like as a boy? What was it like for him to live through Jim Crow? How is my family connected to slavery in America? Is why did my granddad leave North Carolina in the 1930s? Um, usually these are the type of questions that only a family can answer. Um, in addition, I had questions about my family's lack of recollection of her past, whether it was some vital records, a list of births and deaths written in pages of the family Bible, or an image that had been shared and reprinted so many times that the fog of digital artifacts closed, clouded its surface. Some of these questions cannot be answered, but the stories and threads of truth exist in so many versions that, that they can be transferred into the realm of myth. In searching for the historical record that surrounds my family's history, I've run into many dead ends and I'm left with a never looming question, why can't anyone remember? So in an effort to reconstruct the stories of the past, I started by interviewing my extended family members and from those conversations I began to piece together threads of, my fam of family myths and, and that contain our origin story. I discovered that my family comes from two small towns in North Carolina coast. I also uncovered the names of my great grandparents and I learned that my great grandfather was a farmer. I was told several stories about, about what drove my grandfather north during the Great Migration, which also include murder. Um, the first piece of this project, piece of this project was, the, was a visual audit of black life in 1930s North Carolina. And while researching the Library of Congress archives, I discovered images created by Dorothea Lang and a few other photographers that depict life on plantations, including portraits of individual Black subjects working in the field. Um, these photographs resonated with me in my yearning to reconnect to my past. Um, Amnesia Survival features a set of Black and white images of myself holding reprints of archival photographs. And in the process of holding these images, I began to bend, fold, and manipulate the print using a flatbed scanner to capture the interaction at various stages. The scanner created an extra layer of tension between, um, an extra layer of tension because of the way my hands and parts of the photographs pushed up against the glass. These images represent my search for a, a lost clues and alternative narratives about my grandfather's history, which ultimately will prove futile. Um, and from this, this other part of Amnesia Survival, when I'm already on to like the second bit of it, um, I spent the summer growing a tobacco plant. So you guys can kind of see my, my progress of growing a tobacco plant on my porch here in Morgantown. Um, and from growing this tobacco plant, I began to make chlorophyll prints um, with those same uh, Library of Congress archive images um, from the tobacco that I grew. Most of these images are Dorothea Lang's images that I'm using. This is still very much a work in progress, so I don't have all the all my all my academic words behind this project yet. Um, but I wanted to give you guys a hint of what I've been working on. And that is it. Thank you guys so much for listening to my talk. Um, and I will unshare my screen to talk to Eileen. Thank you. Thank you, Raymond. That was amazing. And I, 
I think everyone was really inspired by just your words, your research, but also how you share those stories and the unique ways of um, telling stories through so many different um, methodologies. So bravo to you. Um, I just had a few thoughts as you were talking. Um, Black People in Trees reminds me of a lecture that I heard by Carrie James Marshall, who talked about how important it is to portray Black people doing mundane and ordinary things. And for me, when, as soon as I saw that work, I thought this is exactly what he's talking about, how if you're going to do a Google search for Black people and the word trees, that it's not going to be pictures of lynching. It's like it's so important that we erase that with larger amounts of photos of just ordinary activities. And so um, I don't know if you want to speak to that, because I think that is a really, really powerful thought. Yeah. No, yeah, definitely. I. I mean, that was like my entry, you know, in that in the space of searching, trying to figure out how I want to make pictures outside of the photojournalism space. And I was just so struck. Um, I was also related to it because it was the woods have always been a space that I've always felt uncomfortable. I grew up outside Washington, DC, and it was something that it's a place you wouldn't go to. And I never asked the question why. Um, I never saw myself in that space. I never saw people who look like me in that space. And it became really important to like try to remedy that, even though that's a very large task to do in a Google search or something like that. But I just want to see more. And I thought, you know, by doing this work, I can at least can start it. So folks who do see it can imagine like, yes, this is possible. This is a thing that happens. Um. If I day every tree in the forest. I hear that, and I'm wondering if that's my video. I have to find it. Can anyone else hear that? Okay. It's so important to reconsider histories. And of course, the South has many, many, many histories that need to be re examined. Okay, I have to. Oh, here we go. I've got it turn this off. Okay, now I have to get back to Zoom. And everyone else is muted, so I think it might. Yeah, it was me. Okay, um, okay. so I, recently I featured the work of Ken Gonzalez Day on Lens Scratch, where he had researched California histories, and it was all about the lynchings in California, and that blew my mind because that was his, those were histories I was unaware of. And um, I would assume that there is a lot of work to be done um, in terms of really looking at archives and histories. And um, do you want to talk about your, I mean, so much of your ba work is based on research and um, uh, some of the things that you're really interested in at this point, besides your family and personal things, but more historical things. <laughs> Oh yeah, there's so much to do. I, I need to clone myself so I can do them all. Um, yeah, I've in doing some of the research that 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 white uh, white uh, black face and white spaces. There's so many little hints. There's you know Buffalo soldiers who like who you know apparently at some point were guarding Yosemite, and so many other little stories like that. And one of the reasons sort of drove me in this direction was the idea that I, these are images that I've never seen. Like I've never seen images of Buffalo soldiers at Yosemite. I've never seen, you know, for various technology, time and technology, but I haven't even seen any image, even drawings or prints of, or paintings of like people's occupying space. Like I've never seen any images of, you know, um, the uh, Maroons who occupied outside of, you know, Chesapeake area on the island who fled savory like these stories weren't there and to me it's so important to i mean not just me but for an army of artists to get out there and start interacting with these stories yeah. um to build up these archives because there's, there's a whole another set of histories that are from parallel in the united states that simply have not especially visual histories that are just have not been collected or even worked on yet so you need to build an army yeah <laughs> Um, so you have worked in such a diverse background in photography. 
um, you're not the typical student. You are way beyond that. You are a fully formed photographer. You've worked in newspaper, editorial, documentary, video production, and now in fine art. Do each feed your soul in the same way? No, I think, I mean, I was just thinking about this today. I was looking at, I forgot the photographer's book or something, what book I want to buy. And I was like, is additional photojournalist and making these beautiful images. And I was like, yes, it reminds me when I get to go travel and I'm just me and my camera and nearly I'm re reacting to the space I'm in. Um, well, at the same time, I, I find art is satisfying the intellectual side of me, the side of me that I'm able to sort of like, I'm not bound by the rules of photojournalism, which are always in the present. I would, and I wanted to be able to shift my perspectives to the past and also in the future. Um, and I needed a new space to do that. And um, so I think I still love documentary and photojournalism and I still look at it. Um, I even make it on occasion. I still make it as well. But there's something in the new space I am that I'm sort of opening up a whole new set of doors that are allowing me to think about things in different ways. Yeah, I think fine art gives you another language, another way to tell your story. So definitely. Um, in your conversation with Aaron Turner, you mentioned that you grew up in a diverse community in DC. And then when you were in high school, you moved to an area that was much more white and probably felt like an outsider for the first time. And I just wondered how those two experiences kind of shaped who you are and the work you make? Good question. I, you know, I, that's, I forgot I said that. <laughs> but no, yeah, totally. No, yeah, I mean, I grew up, like, I want to say, like, my elementary school was like a, a United Nations in the 1990s, right? The 1980s. Um, I had all people from all over the world, and I didn't think about race at all, even out through the beginning part of my high school. But when I moved out into rural Virginia, um, Emily was like, hit in the face with like black, white racial division. And I think because I grown up with such a diverse group of people that I think I was sort of, I got a little bit of a, I call it a race vacation, you know? And when people ask me, when I go travel to different places in the world, like when I leave the United States, there's a certain weird pressure that leaves, um, that leaves me and I call that a race vacation, but there's something about um, being kept away from the intensities of, of racism in America just a little just long enough um, that it, it didn't like jade me too much, uh, mm -hmm. I think. And I think it's coming, I mean, I don't know. I, I think I'm still dealing with how it's influencing me as a person. I mean, there's me as younger me and now me now. And also the times you live in are kind of like clouding my vision slightly, but I don't know. I think that's, a, that's something that I will have to reflect more on as well. Yeah. Well, I really, I love that term race vacation because I, I, you know, I can only imagine what that, I remember reading um, photographer Miranda Barnes was saying how just being alone in her backyard where with no eyes on her was like such an amazing feeling of just peacefulness with, with no, you know, she was, she was having her vacation. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I'm gonna let others ask you questions, but we have a, a practice at LACP, which is called Inside the Photographer's Studio, uh, a la James Lipton. So I'm gonna ask you a few questions and just answer the first thing that comes in your head. What is your favorite book and or movie? Oh man, uh, my favorite movie is, is still to this day is Goonies. <laughs> <laughs> Love Goonies. We'll watch that anytime it comes on. <laughs> and I would say books, books a little bit harder. I think I would say Gabriel uh, Garcia Marquez's uh, 100 Years of Solitude. Good choice. Okay, what is your favorite cocktail? An old fashioned. Excellent. Um, what part of the world would you love to visit that you haven't seen yet? Uh, 
Um, I would, I've never been to Tokyo or anywhere. I'm really curious about the experience of like being amongst all the light of the downtown Tokyo, Japan scene. Um, Cause I've seen so much, I've, I've, I've like consumed so much of about the area in my pop culture. So I'm just curious what it would be like to stand in that space with all the bright lights and yeah. Cool. What profession other than photography would you have enjoyed? Yeah, I'm cheating if I say being a director, a movie director is too close to photography, but maybe, I think maybe a musician you like play playing a, like jazz musician, uh, playing the, uh, the trumpet. Trumpet, okay. And tell us something about you that we would possibly never know. I love the barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like not just like barbecue on the grill, but like long, long, slow roasting processes that yeah. take two days to prepare for and another 10 hours to complete. <laughs> oh, sounds good. Yeah. I'm there. Yes. <laughs> um, so the audience, please ask questions. Um, really, Raymond is a font of knowledge. Not only is he getting an MFA, he's teaching and he's working at the college. So, um, you know, he he has a lot of answers. Um, you're getting a lot of accolades in the chat. Um, great presentation, images and video. Loved how you weaved research and history so naturally. Printing on tobacco, fantastic. Tobacco prints are amazing. Great presentation. Um, amazing thought process behind the images and stories. Um, so, I'm not getting any questions here. Um, come on, people. Um, I mean, maybe, how do you do it all? Oh, with COVID, I think my hair is turning grayer faster. No lie. <laughs> it's like, right now, it's like, oh, only I'm, I'm glad that this COVID happened in my third year. MFA and not like the first because I don't know if I'd have been able to finish you know like but I can see the light at the end of the tunnel right now so um and so I can see it so I can get there um it's very it's a lot of juggling a lot of juggling um but also like I don't I'm, I'm older I don't have much going on so I just like work and make work <laughs> and you know come home <laughs> it's like so Okay, well, someone would like you to really talk about the tobacco leaf printing and how that works. Yeah, it's really, so there is a photographer and I butcher his name every time, um, a Vietnamese photographer who was printing um, like images from the Vietnam War on leaves. Um, and basically all it, it's called core fill printing and literally it's like leaf positive image uh, from like your um, your picto, your picto film, you print it in an inkjet, and it's like in a in a contact press and not in the sunlight. It ha but I'm I'm still in the process of making some, but it's actually past time of year. You really can only do this like in a two month period. I'm finding without having ridiculous long print times, but they can take as much to a day to three days to make. Um, but you you need bright hot sunlight in order for that process to work. Um, but I had to grow to also, you know, part of this process. And I know that one have done much of this work already, but I don't know. I felt like there's something about me growing these leaves myself and me physically handling those leaves. It's also trying to connect back to the, in the one of the myths, one of the stories in my family is that my grandfather as a boy would have grown tobacco or would have grown cotton. And this, it was the way, another, another layer for me to actually touch um, something that would have been just to connect on that level. Um, so if it's to, for me to physically handle them was, was an important part of the process. Um, a couple of people have asked um, if you could talk more about the process of going from researching to your amazing images or about your process of starting a project. Um, good question. It's you know, so much I, I'm learning 
oftentimes I get inspired by books that I read or uh, culture, something that I've seen um, or an idea that I come across. And from that, then I, I know and I kind of switch over to the visual. Um, but it usually like say, I mean, the, really it all came from like, it came from some theory from Christina Sharp. And then I read some stuff about nature and the environment. And now it's just like really trying to focus on um, what it meant, what is the, the relationship to African-Americans in the woods in the United States? What did that mean? So I'm always, I kind of come up with like a question and I try to answer that question with the pictures that I make. Um, I think, did I answer that question? I th yeah, I just, I mean, really I come up with a question and that gets kind of that I mull on for a, you know, a little while in my head and then try to attempt to answer that question um, with the work that I make. Okay, I'm going to drill down on that a little bit. So you, now you have your question. Where do you start looking for answers? Um, I look for answers in all kinds of places. One of the, the places has been a lot in... It's, it's such an interesting thing to be studying, or especially now to be looking at like, African-American like, uh, criticism and in these books, cause I'm like, I'm trying to understand, like one of the questions is in my head is I think about like blackness, like at these two ongoing thoughts. One is like, so what is black aesthetics and what is blackness as an aesthetic? And if you wanna like hang out in my head as it loop around those thoughts, like most all the work I've been doing now is like, I'm just, I've been trying to figure out, so what does it mean to make Black art, and there's a lot of history and a lot of baggage and a lot of baggage around the Black body and photography, and there are all these things, and I just usually just kind of swim in these spaces and these questions, and I make it work. Um, and what I've noticed about, it's so hard to talk about exactly the process of making work, because what happens is I get one idea, I pump around with it, and it's really bad for a long time, and then I end up drilling down on one idea hard um, until I finish it. Um, so I, I mean, I don't know, I, I feel almost goofy in that way that my ideas are so loopy, but literally I ask myself these questions that I'm, and I try to figure out what does this mean? But all this comes from a lack of education and knowledge about this in my formal education. These things aren't talked about. I've never heard about them. I've hardly even seen them in our history classes. Like I have no knowledge of this. I'm like a newbie and I'm trying to like learn as much as I can. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's really, this this stuff isn't there. Yeah. Like, it's not really available. Um, and I've never, I've taken a lot of different college classes and I've never, been, we've never talked about these issues, especially when it comes to POC bodies in art and photography, just in general. Um, usually the body is, you know, a service in which people, you know, paint their meanings of what that thing means on, but not the other way around in my, and I want to think about reversing that from, like what does blackness look like outside of the, the gaze of whiteness? That's the question that's in my head now. Yeah. It will be probably for a long time. I mean, that was pretty profound statement when you said you made that work about the, those women that took the bus and that you realize as a photojournalist that your audience was white and you were making work about a black experience. And you know, all of these things, all of us need to digest this and think about it. I mean, it's it's such an exciting time in a sense. It's such a powerful and meaningful time in history. Um, I think a lot of things, I mean, having wonderful educators like yourself, things will change in the classroom. Um, histories will shift. And um, I just, I can't tell you how excited I am for all the work you're doing. It's just Thank fantastic. You. Thank you. Um, okay, I've got one more question. Um, what was your journey as a young photographer uh, becoming a photojournalist? Oh, <laughs> it was, I worked in the exurbs of Virginia, like outside Washington, DC at these small weekly newspapers. Um, it was hard to even get into photojournalism. It took two years to break in. Like I was in Chicago actually studying with John H. White, who was a photographer in Chicago sometimes. And I took I took a bunch of classes with him. See, I have this long winding journey through college. Like basically I went there. I went there for one semester, I ran out of money. 
and I was broke, just hanging out in Chicago. Um, and I ended up like, John let me just like sit in on two of it, the next photojournalism classes. So um, I still continue to practice and to learn with him. Um, and from there, you know, eventually I landed a job like two, three years later um, in Virginia. And I worked out in the middle of nowhere. I'm like the only African-American photographer in the area. Um, at, at that time, a lot of that stuff at the time didn't bug me that much because I've, I've lived it in Virginia in the South for so long, especially out there, you know, there are Confederate statues everywhere. Uh, people would say things to me um, all the time. The best, the best thing ever, and I like to tell the story, is the time that like uh, a guy, a, re, a Civil War reenactor walked up to me. Uh, he was dressed as Robert E. Lee, which is and he's like, you talk very well for a Black person. And I was just like looking at him and I was like, I was represented in the newspaper. So I was like, I kind of looked around. It's like, is there a camera coming? Someone, someone's <laughs> recording this. Please tell me like, just can't believe this just happens. Oh, <laughs> I just sort of like looked at him. He gave me his business card instead of Robert E. Lee or something like that. Oh man, I wish I had that on camera. Yeah. But like it, the experience was interesting working in like excerpts, Virginia and coming against, up, up against stuff with passive racism all the time. But like, I was just trying to like, make it to the New York Times like that was my goal it's like New York Times staff photographer blah 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 so what would I have to do in this space to get there um at that time that was my goal so I just kind of put my head down and kept working and we have another question saying how did you move from photojournalism to fine art literally it was the moment I realized that uh I was using like it was RG Lord, like the master's tools can't dismantle the master's house. Like literally I was using the, the tool of, I mean, the photojournalism, the style of the 35 millimeter camera is the tool. I wouldn't call the tool the oppressor is that's too hard, but it's like photography has a long history that needs to be dealt with. And I realized that at that point that I still love it and I still wanted to do it, but I needed to figure out different ways of going about it. Um, because I didn't want to simply to, you know, replicate the stereotypes that the cameras already made. Um, so that's when I realized that I needed to move on. Don't get me wrong, I still do, I still get paid uh, to do photojournalism and to do that kind of work and I, and I go out and do it. Um, but it's not my heart work anymore. It's the work I've been doing long enough to know how to do well. Um, but it's not the stuff that I get very excited about anymore. Yeah, I mean, fine art is such a creative way of thinking outside of the box and um, and you've done such a beautiful job at that. And uh, I can't wait to see the your finished series of your family and because African-American histories, unfortunately, always lead back to a non-African-American and they stop there. And mm -hmm. I think for you to maybe create your own family history is, yeah. is a um, really a profound and wonderful thing. So yeah. thank you. Well, any more questions other than that? We'll let um, it's it's a little bit later <laughs> for Raymond. He is uh, three hours later, so he has to work tomorrow. Um, I guess not. So Thank you so much. And um, as part of his 2020 Lens Scratch Prize, I get to quote unquote mentor him. And honestly, he is mentoring me. Um, I'm learning so much from him and I, I'm excited just to have him as a friend and someone who I get to, to visit with every month. So for me, it's just a pleasure to share you with especially the Los Angeles community and um, as I said in the chat, you're getting lots of love and um, continue making fantastic work. We need you. So have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much for listening and all the kind words. But... Thank you so much. It was wonderful. Thanks. Bravo, Raymond, bravo. Great Thank presentation, Thank you, Raymond. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to LACP for hosting this event. Thank you. Thank you, Raymond. It was great work. It was really great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, friend. We'll see you soon. All right. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much.